have a few comments that I'd like to make. And first of all, I, I want to thank all of you for, for, uh, for coming here. And um, I just want to say that, um, um, you know, our club uh, includes good folks who contribute to our community of Greenville. As members, uh, we have here actually members of our city council, um, Mayor Emmett Jordan. He's in the back there. <laughs> Council Member Jay Davis. Um, Council Members Rick Gordon and Council Members Colin Bird. And in our audience, we also have our Mayor Pro Tem, Kristen Weaver. And then sitting with us is also at least most of our 22nd state legislative. District Team, Senator Paul Pinsky. <laughs> Delegates, Alonzo Washington and Nicole Williams. <laughs> and Healy was unable to make it. And then also, I've just been provided this uh, note, and I'm glad that Jay Davis just gave this to me. We also have County Councilman Todd Turner. <laughs> and from the Bowie City Council, Ingrid Harrison. Central Committee, Ernest Hanless, and Lee Rogers from the Prince George's County Commission for Women. And I just want to say, I think all of you probably know this and can appreciate this. This is really a team effort. And we want to thank each of you who have written a question, from which we have chosen three for our moderator, Dave Zarin, to ask of each candidate. So these questions come from you. The service our club provides today is but a piece of what we bring to the greater Greenbelt area. Since our inception in 1976, we have held debates and forums, paid tribute to Martin Luther King on his birthday, and to our black and women's history, as well as environmental, civil, GLBTQ, and labor rights. We've helped to register folks, and we should be back serving funnel cakes at the Labor Day Festival close to the Roosevelt Town Center. <laughs> Maybe that's the biggest news, perhaps. And also, I want everyone to know that in May, our 22nd legislative district team will present a report of a very busy 22 term this coming May. It will be May 20th. So stay in touch with us. A number of you have picked up forms. Become a member. If you're not a member, if your uh, membership status has expired, renew with us. And I just want to say it's, it's obviously <clears throat> clear to all of us, but it's not about any one individual. It's about us. And it's about providing a common sense of decency for all. And let's vote and let's get a, a Democrat elected. Uh, let, let me try that one more time. <laughs> Take two. Put everything we have into the effort to getting a Democrat elected governor. We need that change. Thank you all. And now a wonderful moderator and a wonderful human being, Dave Sarah. Thank you, Conrad. I can taste those funnel cakes already. Already. You know, in addition to all the wonderful people that he introduced, we also have an interpreter right here in the front row. Would you stand up so we can recognize you? She's going to be doing yeoman's work all afternoon. And making us look good and me sound good and all of us sound good, uh, Phoebe McFarb and Frank Gervasi right here from Gate TV. And keeping us on our toes this afternoon, Rick Gordon right there with the buzzer that isn't loud enough to wake the dead. Where do you hear this one? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the great things about living in Greenbelt, one of the interesting things about living here, is when you're out and about, you run into people who recognize you, which is always nice. And because everyone is so civic-minded, they ask you to do something for them. I can remember not too many years ago at the Sunoco station over in Old Greenbelt, the late, great Kelly Ivey was there. He used to sit there at the picnic table and hold court, 
And I pulled in to fill in my tank one day, and he said, Dave Zarin? I said, yeah. He said, you know, we could use a new MC for the Greenbelt Labor Day Parade. I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, you'll love it. So innocently enough, I said, sure, I'll help you out, not knowing how much work was involved. But you know, I love that job. Every year I look forward to that parade, and you know, it is something that defines Greenbelt, and I know you all agree with me on that. And then about a month ago, Katie Pape, who is part of this club, the Roosevelt Club. She was at the, is Katie here today? Where's Katie? Hey, Katie. I was coming out of the fitness center, having had a swim, minding my own business. And Katie, who I did not know, she said, Dave Zarin, Conrad Hurling is looking for you. I said, what did I do? He, she said, no, he wants you to MC the gubernatorial forum that's coming up in a few weeks. Well, look at Katie, you can't say no to someone like that. And you certainly can't say no to Conrad Hurling. So when he did get in touch with me, he is a native green belter, and uh, I'm here because he does more for this city than a lot of other people. We wouldn't be here today without him. Let's have a nice hand for Conrad, please. You know, I'm glad six of our aspiring governors didn't say no to Conrad's invitation as well. We're so happy you're all here in our town. That you're doing what a lot of us learn to do in life. You're making your own luck. Who knows what it is you'll say today that will resonate with the voters in this room or those watching, or how your demeanor and manners might endear you to them. You know, uh, you're auditioning today. You've been auditioning for weeks, and you're going to be doing it for months ahead here. I remember back in 1990, which seems like ancient history, I auditioned when they put out a call at WJLA ABC7 for a weekend weather forecaster. So I went, and I tried out. I thought I did fine. I never thought I would get the job. Well, the news director, he had different ideas. He said, I like you. We're going to train you. You're ours. And I thought, well, this will last a couple of weeks. Well, 25 years later, I was still doing that. So uh, my, my point is, uh, you never know if you want something. If you want it, you, you might get it. You just might get it. So we have six, five people here today who are hoping that they will be governor. None of them has been governor before. One of them may be the next governor right here. And they're going to get in there and they, yeah, everyone said, it's me, it's me. They're gonna get in there and they're going to find that it's a long learning curve, it's a tough learning curve, but all of their experience will be brought to bear. They'll make some mistakes, but we hope that they will make us proud. Uh, so this afternoon, my job is to read some questions, many of which you wrote yourselves. Uh, I hope you enjoy the proceedings. I'll do my best to keep it moving, to be informative, maybe even a little entertaining. My mantra has always been in television that if I'm having a good time, chances are the viewers are too. So I'm enthused about this, and to paraphrase what Jose diaz Balart, the NBC Weekend anchor, always says at the end of his broadcast, I thank you in advance for the privilege of your time. You did not have to be here today, but we thank you for being here. All right, it is time to get started. We have three questions. Each of the panelists here will have one minute to introduce themselves for each question, they have two minutes to give a response, and at the end, a two-minute uh, wrap-up for each one. We're going to go alphabetically to start here, so let us start with our first candidate, and uh, he's sitting over there at the end, Mr. Barron. Mr. Barron, welcome to the program here. Thank you. And uh, it's nice to have you in Greenbelt, and uh, would you tell us a little bit about yourself, and we'll, we'll get that clock going, and we're going to give you a minute. Hi. I'm John Barron. Uh, I'm, a, I'm glad to be here. I'm a former nonprofit executive, I've been an, and I've been an appointee of Democratic and Republican presidents. I'm running for governor because Maryland is not making progress on major problems that damage the lives of millions of people, and I'm offering a fundamentally different approach. In education, more than a quarter of middle school students in our state can't read at a basic level. Those numbers are no different than they were 20 years ago. Moderate-income Marylanders have seen stagnant wages since the 1980s. 
as income inequality has soared, and we've made zero progress reducing our state's poverty rate in more than 30 years. Fellow Marylanders, we can't just keep doing the same thing we've been doing for decades, rolling out one unproven government program after another and expect a different result because many programs, no matter how well-intentioned they are, just don't work. Instead, we need to expand solutions that don't just sound good, but have been tested in the real world and shown to make a big difference in people's lives. I'll discuss examples today. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Good way to start our forum here this afternoon. Joining us next is uh, someone probably recognizable to a lot of people, uh, Mr. Doug Gansler. Doug, nice to have you here in Greenbelt. Thanks, thank you for having me, and, and thank you to the club for putting this on, and thank you, um, particularly the other four candidates who bothered to show up and recognize that uh, your vote is important to all of us, and so for making the effort to be here. Um, my name is Doug Gansler. I was, I've been in government for 23 years. I was an assistant United States attorney under Eric Holder in the District of Columbia. I was the state's attorney in Montgomery County for eight years, and I was your attorney general for eight years, and president of all the attorneys general in the country for one of those years. So I guess I, I hate to differ with my moderator, but I am, uh, it, it's not really a long and tough road. We will be ready on day one. I've done this before. We've represented all 56 units of government, and I'm excited for the opportunity to be your governor. I'm running with Candace Hollinsworth, who is the, was the mayor of Hyattsville, six and a half miles from here. She took over um, and really uh, transformed that city and then left to start our Black Party, a national nonprofit organization with about 20,000 members. And I look forward to our vision, sharing our vision uh, today with you. Thank you, Mr. Gansler. And I admit, did not mean to demean the amount of experience sitting on the panel up here oh, today, no. not in the least. <laughs> and all of you bring a lot of skill to, uh, we'll bring a lot of skill to Annapolis. Next, let's hear from Mr. Ashwani Jane from Montgomery County. Just met the gentleman recently. You have the floor, sir. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Ashwani Jane, and I use he, him pronouns. I'm a 32-year-old cancer survivor, a son of immigrants and small business owners, and a product of Maryland Public Schools. I've worked in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, the Obama White House, and two federal agencies. And I'm running for governor to make politics inclusive and accessible. Because right now, it's not. If you're black or brown, you feel like this country doesn't value your life. If you're a woman, you feel disgusted that men can decide what you do with your body. If you're trans, you feel like your life somehow seems not worth it or inappropriate. If you have a disability, you feel talked down to. And if you're a young person, you're told you don't have enough experience to lead on issues, even though it's been young people who led the feminist, labor, climate, and Black Lives Matter movements. Yeah. So I believe decisions about us should not be made without us. I look forward to this opportunity and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that passionate opening statement there. We now move to Mr. Tom Perez. Tom, nice to have you here in Greenbelt. It's great to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Tom Perez, and I live in Tacoma Park, Maryland, a city that has the same tradition of civic engagement that you have here in Greenbelt. I'm running for governor to fight for jobs, justice, and opportunity. That's been my whole life's work at a local level, at a state level, at a federal level. Ten years ago, I was the head of the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department under Eric Holder. We were taking on voting rights, we were taking on labor rights, we were taking on predatory lenders. I worked, a, I was a local elected official in Montgomery County serving on the County Council and I had the privilege of serving as your state labor secretary as well as your United States labor secretary. Folks, I want to make sure that zip code never determines destiny. I want to make sure that everybody has a job that pays a good middle class wage. I want to make sure that here in Maryland, every school child has access to opportunity by fully implementing the blueprint for educational reform. And I want to make sure that every single person in this state can succeed. Thank you very much, sir. Enjoyed hearing that opening statement. And the last of our candidates here today is uh, Mr. Jerome Siegel. Uh, Jerry, Jerome, or is yours? Jerome. Hi. Um, well, I'm an unrepentant uh, 1960s radical, um, but I'm not part of that new left movement that believed in electoral politics. Uh, I worked four years on the Hill, 10 years in the executive branch, 25 years at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Uh, I'm best known, actually, for my work on international conflict resolution. I ran against Ben Cardin in 2018 because he's abhorrent on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and I'm running today as a bread and roses socialist. 
What is bread and roses? It's a coherent ideology, but quickly, it's three-fifths Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. It's one-fifth Thoreau of Walden Pond, and it's one-fifth the pre-Marxian utopian socialists. And that utopian part of it is very important. And what I'm gonna to try to show you today is how we can go from very commonplace policies on housing, transportation, and so on, to utopian changes that will amount to a cultural revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Nice round of applause for the opening statements for all five of our candidates up here. And if you're like me, you couldn't take your eye off, uh, aren't these neat, these little bonnets on here, on the microphones to keep everything sanitized here? They pulled out all the stops for us. We have three questions now for each of our candidates, each uh, person up here, each man will have two minutes for each of the three questions. And the question, the first question, it will go to uh, Mr. Barron. Uh, and then in succession, we'll go down the, the line here. Gentlemen, if, if you had a magic wand and can, w could wave it right now, what is the one thing you would wish for to make life better for all Marylanders right now? About that for a moment. And Mr. Barron, we'll give you two minutes. Wave that magic wand for us. Okay, here we go. Here comes the magic. Um, one of the biggest problems facing Maryland is that for the bottom 40% of Maryland households, they have seen flat wages since the 1980s while income inequality has soared. In other words, I mean, we've all sort of known that, read about, but this has been a long-term problem. The, American narrative of optimism and progress, a rising tide to lift all boats, does not apply to an astonishingly large share of our population. As governor, that would be my top priority, to change that. What would I do? The first, we need to give people the skills, the education, the training they need to succeed in the workforce that's the area where we have fallen down the most. So as one example of what I would do in this area, in my first 100 days, I would announce and launch a partnership with businesses across the state to provide effective job training to every young adult in the entire state of Maryland who wants to advance. Now the theme of my campaign is doing things that are tested and proven, and here's the evidence. Job training, if it is done right, has been shown to increase earnings by as much as 40%. But the key is to focus that training on industries that are fast growing, that's number one, like information, technology, and healthcare, where there are well-paying jobs. And number two, um, to work hand in hand with local employers who provide paid internships to the trainees. So under my plan, the state will pay for the training, the businesses will pay for the partnerships. Our economy gets skilled workers. Everybody benefits from that. This is just one example of a tested and proven program that we would scale up statewide in Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Barron. All right, we're, we're talking wizardry here. Mr. Gansler, you're waving a magic wand, and the one thing that you would want to happen instantly for all Marylanders to make their lives better, if you could do it. I think it would be less wizardry and more experience, um, and that is crime. And what I hear as I go around the state is that we have a crime issue, um, and it's, per it's penetrating all areas of the state. And I've made a career out of bringing crime down while bringing justice up. So I started in 1989 as the head of the NAACP uh, Criminal Justice Committee in Montgomery County, and later became state's attorney in Montgomery County. Um, after having served as, a, as an assistant United States attorney with Eric Holder. And what we did when I was in the homicide section there is we started something called community prosecution, where it's prosecuted by neighborhood, by crime. Can, can you imagine if the state's attorney's office in Prince George's County had a prosecutor assigned to work with the community police here in Greenbelt so they would know who's supposed to be here, who's not, what gangs are here, who are the good people, who are the bad people, and make sure we ferreted out crime. Well, I brought community prosecution to the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office, um, was the first office in the country to fully implement community prosecution, which helped bridge the gap between law enforcement and the people they serve. We have to recognize that crime disproportionately impacts communities of color, 
and, and underserved communities. Nobody's getting shot in Potomac, Maryland tonight. And so uh, when I became Attorney General, um, we, we kept that fight up. I won a Supreme Court case 9 nothing on a child sex abu abuser. We need to, uh, I started the first drug courts in Maryland's history. I started the first domestic violence courts in Maryland's history. I started the Family Justice Center in Rockville, Maryland. All of those will become statewide, every jurisdiction in Maryland, if I become governor. I, I know the difference between an indictment and a conviction. I'm the only person running in either party who has any background whatsoever in criminal justice and criminal justice reform. And we need to get the guns off the streets, we need violent offenders off the streets, and we need to make sure things like drug court and others and having SROs in schools take people away from going to jail and, and put them on the streets. Thanks for sharing all that with us, Mr. Gansler. We appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Jane, the magic wand goes to you next. The one, the one thing that if you could do it right now that would change and better the lives of Marylanders, what would you do? To make politics inclusive and accessible. It's as simple as that. Uh, and this idea started back when I was battling cancer at the age of 13. I remember not knowing if I'm going to live to see the four walls outside of that hospital room. And I lost all control over my life. I was told when to wake up, when to eat, when to sleep, what medicines to take. I lost all my hair and my confidence. I felt depressed, suicidal, and helpless. And it hurt to have other people make decisions for me instead of with me. And ironically and unfortunately, so many Marylanders feel that way about politics right now. Because whether you talk about any issue, reproductive justice, housing, healthcare, education, infrastructure, economic development, I believe if residents are not given a seat at the table in a very easy way, none of those policies will be equitable. And we see this in every single election. We have the same debates over the same issues every time. That's why if you look at any one of the 150 plus policies that we have shared in full detail, fully paid for at janeforgovernor.com, they were all made by residents who were impacted by those policies from each and every county. One of those signature programs that looks at issues comprehensively is what I'm calling the Maryland Now Plan. It's going to eliminate the state income tax for 95% of Marylanders, make public transit free for every Maryland resident, make sure we have the nation's first guaranteed jobs program, legalize marijuana while expunging records, and tangibly getting money out of politics. And we're not waiting until the election to in institute this type of inclusivity and accessibility. We're already doing that on our campaign. We have created the first statewide campaign in the United States that is 100% run by residents from every age, background, and county. Thank you very much, Mr. Jane. All right, there, Mr. Perez, there is, there is no magic wand in life, but if you had one, you can use that pen as a, as yeah, I was, substitute. I was wondering, yeah. If you could wave it right now, what would you do? And make our lives better, instantly. Make sure everyone gets a fair shake. That's what my life's been about, prosecuting civil rights cases, making sure that people are judged by the content of their character and not anything else, making sure that we have climate justice in this country. So how do we make sure everyone has a fair shake? Starts with education, making sure we fully implement the blueprint so that from cradle through career, everyone in every zip code gets access to opportunity. Making sure everybody has access to health care. We've got 375,000 uninsured Marylanders. A recent study showed that 25% of COVID deaths were because we have 375,000 uninsured Marylanders. I already put out a plan. I used to serve on the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the uninsured. I put out a plan so that we can do that here in Maryland. Making sure that people have access to a quality job. That's what I did at the U.S. Labor Department. That's what I did at the Maryland Labor Department. We were Match.com. You know, we matched job seekers seeking to punch their ticket to the middle class with employers seeking to grow their business. Those are things that are just so critically important. Transportation options. If you can't get to opportunity, you can't get a fair shake. And you know what, folks? I look here. Here's one transportation option we shouldn't implement, and that's the maglev. Here's a transportation op option we should implement, and that is finish the damn purple line. It's a mile from my house, it's a mile from your house, and it has been an absolute construction zone. We've gotten a flat tire. I bet you you've gotten some flat tires because of this governor's incompetence. Folks, that's what government should do. Make sure everybody has a fair shake. 
And the next governor is going to have to be the multitasker in chief. Because I haven't had an opportunity to talk to you about the opioid crisis, haven't had an opportunity to talk about broadband. We can't have equal educational opportunity if we don't have broadband access everywhere. And the next governor is going to have to do all of these and then some. And that is why I am running for governor. That governor has to be that multitasker in chief. That governor has to have the requisite experience because we can't afford a governor who has to get into an apprenticeship program. I love apprenticeship. I dramatically expanded apprenticeship when I was your labor secretary. I don't think the governor should be in an apprenticeship program. We've got to start and do our job right away. And when we do that, we get a fair shake. We're the richest state in the country, and yet we have the highest incarceration rate of black men. We have incredibly troubling uh, racial disparities in infant maternal mortality. That's not a, a Maryland at its best, and that's what will change. Thank you, Mr. Perez. And last person to address the magic wand question, Mr. Siegel, the one problem that you would solve if you could do it instantly. Yeah, the big problem is the lack of time in our lives. Um, what I intend to do is to put time back on the labor agenda. Once it, once, once it was the case that we went from the 60-hour the week to the 50-hour week to the 40-hour week, and we stopped then, and since then it's gotten worse. We have a time famine in this society. So what I want to make it possible is for people to take back their time, um, and we can do it. Now, what does that time be for? Well, some of it will be just be for friends and family that are starved, relationships that are starved, friendships that are starved, relationships between parent and children that are, that are starved. But some of it will have to do with work. And there are two kinds of work. There's instrumental work, job system work, work that you do only because you get paid for it. And then there's what I call passion work. Passion work that's so inherently yours, so much tied to any deep sense of happiness that you would do it for free if you didn't need the money. And what we're talking about is a transition from five days of job system work to four days of job system work to three days of job system work and maybe, three, maybe two, three, four, include the weekend, four days of passion work. When that happens, who you are will change. You will not, when you ask somebody, you hear that somebody's getting married, you ask who it is, you won't be asking how do they make their money. You'll be asking how do they do, what's their passion work. And what I want to show you is that very simple policies, for instance, in transportation, can free up. So transportation right now uh, occupies 20% of the household budget. 20% of the work week is one day, right? A hundred years ago, transportation was zero. All right, we can, with policies about cheap, I call it the near-free EV, we can take that 20% and knock it down to 5%. That's 15% of the labor, 15% of the week that we freed up, which means your weekend starts 10.30 on Friday. And we can go into the details of how we can get that free EV here in Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. And both you and Mr. Perez, uh, serve as good lead-ins to this second question. And Mr. Siegel, we'll start at the other end of the table here. So you'll get the first opportunity for this next question. As, uh, as Tip O'Neill once said, all politics is local. And as you drove in here today, you couldn't help but notice all of the maglev signs all over the neighborhood here. Uh, we are not in favor of maglev for the most part. Uh, so would like for you to weigh in more specifically on your feelings about that train. Uh, do you support the expansion of the Beltway and Route 270 with toll lanes? Tell us what you think about that. What about mass transit alternatives? What about dedicated bus lanes, light rail? As, we're, as we are discovering now with everyone coming back to the office and to school because of the less, lessening of the pandemic, gridlock is back in many places here. Talk to us about the things I just mentioned there. Mr. Siegel. Okay, in, in a sense, this is a continuation of just what I was talking about, because uh, I was talking about transportation. Um, the transportation budget, that 20%, actually, if you go into what it's spent on, it's 99% is the car. The car, in fact, has enslaved us one day a week, okay? So I would do nothing, as it were, to accommodate the car. What I want to do is find a way to minimize it and then to the extent that we use the car, knock the cost of it down by going to electric vehicles that are inexpensive and won't have CO2 emissions because they'll be, they'll be electric. 
so yes, mass transportation, no to expanding the beltway, no to anything on the bridges except having to do with safety. But that's not where we should be spending it. Now look, the best-selling car, electric car in the world, is the Tesla. And it starts at $60,000. Now, we've gotten the Build Back Better bill if Biden never gets it through Congress. If it's built in the United States, $12,500 tax credit. If it's not, $7,500. Then we've got an additional <coughs> Maryland one. But you start with a $60,000 car, and you don't get it down very low, right? However, the second best-selling car in the world is called the Wuling Mini. The Wuling Mini is only sold in China, and it sells for $5,000 a car. And guess who owns 44% of the company making the Wuling Mini? General Motors. Think about that, okay? Well, we can, using the power of our state here, we can bring low-cost electric vehicles to Maryland and to the whole society. When we do that, because 99% of the cost of that 20% that we, that we spend on car, on transportation is the car with a near free EV and those tax credits, in fact, we will liberate three quarters of a day of the week, which you can go and use as you wish for those things that are most meaningful to you in life. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Uh, two minutes for Mr. Perez, the next governor is going to have to be, in many ways, a transportation governor. Can you address some of the things that we're talking about, 270, maglev, uh, and dedicated bus lanes? Well, I already mentioned maglev in my previous question, and if it was any ambiguity, I oppose maglev, okay? And here's why. I, I think of maglev, and I think of what it doesn't do. It doesn't provide any um, opportunities or pathway to mobility for people who really need it. It doesn't provide any benefits to people here. It is not needed. And, and again, this is an area where you, you have to draw a contrast. You have to figure out what are the differences between the candidates in this race. Peter Francho strongly supports Maglev. Tom Perez strongly opposes Maglev. Very, very important distinction. I want to make sure, I, I oppose widening the beltway and I oppose Lexus lanes. We can address gridlock without widening the beltway. I know this, I live in Tacoma Park, I worked in Rockville for many years, I get this. We have to replace the American Legion Bridge, period, hard stop, it's dangerous. And then we can extend the, um, uh, the, the extra lane up to the spur, but we do not need the Lexus lanes. And there are, go on there, you see all these Jersey barriers, you take them down, you can, you can build um, uh, reversible uh, roads there. So during rush hour, you go one way and then you go the other. What we have to do is widen 270 up north as you get closer to Frederick. That's a major league bottleneck. That's what I would do. We have to make sure we build the red line and build a regional transportation authority in Baltimore in the Baltimore region. We have to build rail down to Charles County because that's a major league uh, problem. And we need a mark system that really works. You know what is a four letter word in this state? CSX. We have to make sure we have a mark system, whether you're going up to Frederick or whether you're going up to the Pennsylvania line that can get you all the way through to DC, not just three times a day, but multiple times a day. That's smart transportation policy. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Uh, Mr. Jane, um, you're a Montgomery County resident. We're talking here now about possibly uh, widening 270, toll lanes, your opinions on some of these transportation topics. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So again, I look at the issue of transportation infrastructure in a comprehensive way and really bringing the resident's voice to the table. So we have been deeply opposed to maglev. It's gonna to be too expensive. There was no environmental impact study that was done and there would be no stop in Prince George's County. Ironic, right? Um, I also uh, completely oppose adding toll lanes and expanding the, the 270 corridor. Uh, adding more lanes does not really reduce traffic in the long term. We've seen this time and time again. So that's why I support more designated bus lanes. I spoke earlier about my plan to make public transit completely free. I look at uh, investing and in completing the Purple Line, the Red Line, the Southern Maryland Rapid Transit Project, making sure we're investing in more MTA mobility vehicles as well, and encouraging more ride-sharing opportunities, especially in areas of Maryland where currently mass transit is not available or not accessible. So we have to look at all that. 
but we also have to make sure we have smart growth and mixed use development whenever we're building our towns and our cities. Not just focus on single family housing, but multifamily housing. And that housing should be near transit where it's already available because that also is going to reduce traffic. Housing and traffic are related. Um, and the final part of this is we have to make sure that we conduct environmental impact studies for any piece of legislation that could impact the environment. So that's any transportation bill, any infrastructure bill, I would invest in more analysts so that there is a mandate to require environmental impact studies be done before we start to propose the budget and before we actually start to carry out some of these projects. Thank you, Mr. Jane. We appreciate that. And uh, Mr. Gansler, your, your transportation plan. Yeah, so the one great thing about being experienced uh, is not just because you've sat around in government for a long time, it's because you understand how the levers of government work. So we have very ambitious, all of us have very ambitious plans around transportation, but the question is, will we be able to actually accomplish it and get it done from beginning on day one? So some of the projects that I am very much in favor of is uh, the light rail into Southern Maryland from Branch Avenue into Charles County, is the red line. When Governor Hogan canceled the red line, it was like taking a sledgehammer to Baltimore City. And the problem with Baltimore City in particular in terms of transportation is one third of the folks that live there don't have access to a vehicle. So we need at the red line, we need to have, in all these projects, we need to have um, transit-oriented housing and affordable housing available so people can actually get to their jobs from where they live. The purple line, as Tom Perez said, is a disaster. It, uh, it, it actually makes what's going on um, right now on 270 and the American Legion, Legion Bridge look like a success story. Um, the way in which we do procurement in this state uh, has to be completely overhauled. So it's not, uh, it's not a who you know, uh, but what you know process. In terms of 270, you know, the, the, we need to make sure that this state, it's, it's going to happen. The American Legion Bridge has to get fixed. No one wants to play hot potato without being the person that's driving over the bridge when it falls in. But we need to make sure we have electric vehicles because then the pollution issue goes down. But we don't have the infrastructure here in Maryland yet. If you walk out here, if you were to have an electric vehicle, where would you get a charge? How would you get a charge? Is there accessibility to folks that don't have enough money to charge their electric vehicles at home? So we have to work on that. We need to make sure that we have a way to get from 270 to Frederick at mass transit. Um, we, we need to make sure we, do, we promote our mass transit. We have the money. We're flush right now in our state. In terms of the maglev, you know, we need to do a, have a better system. We, I, I started the first civil rights department in Maryland history, and that's a civil rights uh, debacle. Thank you, Mr. Gansler. Uh, Mr. Barron, you get the last word, how to help Marylanders get around more easily because of it is so tough right now. Okay, uh, thank you. The last word. So um, I'm a very strong supporter of mass transit. I believe in, the, uh, I strongly support the Purple Line and east, also in Baltimore, an east-west solution, presumably the Red Line and other projects. I myself ride the bus to work. I've ridden the bus to work for, uh, for over 25 years. So I am a strong believer. Uh, I have outlined a comprehensive climate plan that would provide strong incentives and insistence and assistance to make sure that we have electric vehicles on the road. Now, that being said, I do support uh, partial expansion of the Beltway. I support the, the current plan from, uh, from the 270 spur through the American Legion Bridge, the expansion there, and the southern portion of I-270 because this is a quality of life issue. I mean, nobody likes sitting in traffic all the time. Uh, Again, we want to move toward electric vehicles on the road, so it's not just uh, uh, from a climate standpoint, that's not a problem. But I do support the partial expansion. And then once that's completed, to see what happens to traffic patterns and then decide whether additional expansion is needed. One last point. Um, we need to change how we procure major infrastructure projects. The Purple Line is over a billion dollars over budget and four years uh, beyond beyond over schedule. Um, I headed a major procurement, pro a billion dollar procurement program in the Department of Defense. And, one of, and I led a number of reforms that won award from, awards from the Vice President and others for reinventing government. One of the key principles is that you emphasize past performance more than other things. In other words, when we hire 
major uh, infrastructure contractors, we need to look for people who don't, don't know how to just write good things on a piece of paper in a proposal, but who have experience managing large infrastructure projects, completing them on time and under budget. Thank you, Mr. Barron, and thank all of you for your specificity as we went through. I think the voters out there appreciated all the, the, the things, the detail you provided on those answers there. Uh, we have one more question. It has to do with education, and we'll be going the order this time. Mr. Perez, you will be first, then Mr. Siegel, then Mr. Jane, then Mr. Uh, Gansler, and then Mr. Barron. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Barron is third, fourth will be Mr. Gassler, and uh, Mr. Jane, you will have the last word. You know, it wasn't too many years ago, I was still teaching here in Prince George's County when, according to U.S. News and World Report, Maryland had the number one schools in the nation. Uh, in the inter intervening years, uh, that ranking has slipped, and we're now trying a lot of different ways to get that ranking again. So. My question to you is, what one education reform, included or not in the Kerwin Commission's Maryland blueprint, would you put at the top of your list for priority implementation? What would do the most good the soonest? Mr. Perez, two, I, two minutes. You have to implement the entire blueprint. If there's one thing you implement but you don't do everything, you're not going to get anything done. And so I, I think this education is the great equalizer. Uh, budgets are moral documents. In the, pre in the governor's budget submission, the original budget submission of a couple months ago, he underfunded education by something like $145 million. What were the two counties that were underfunded? Baltimore City and Prince George's County. That's unconscionable. Yeah, he added it in a month later. I'm not going to applaud someone for doing something he should have done in the first place. So that was unconscionable. So we need to make sure that we have long-term funding sources so that we can accomplish everything. We have to make sure that our, our workforce reflects the diversity of our communities. My running mate, Shannon Sneed, went to undergrad at UMES. She got her graduate degree at Morgan State. She's going to work very closely with us on a diversity initiative with HBCUs so that we can make sure we have a diverse complement of educators and education support professionals. That is critically important. I'm very proud that Local 500 SEIU and Local 2250 of AFSCME, who represent education support professionals, have endorsed our campaign. They understand what it takes to succeed. We need to understand that we have a really large and growing amount of ESOL students. And so we've got to make sure we're investing. We have to understand that the IDEA is one of the biggest unfunded mandates in the federal government. We need to lobby Washington so that we're getting our fair share of federal dollars so that we can, so we can educate special needs kids. I think the most immediate thing we need to do, though, right now, may not have anything to do with the blueprint, but it has everything to do with the mental health crisis that we are in right now. We have a pandemic and we have a mental health crisis. We need to expand our investments in community-based mental health services and services in schools so that we can help our students and our educators and our education support professionals alike. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Uh, Mr. Siegel, uh, your education priorities should you be governor? Well, that's what that handout that I gave you all on your chairs is about. That was my testimony to the Maryland State Education Association yesterday. Um, and what I told them is that the Kerwin Commission, the blueprint, which everybody seems to cow to, really is two different documents. One is a social justice document, and there it's the gold standard for America. And then there's the issue of education itself. What's the mission of schools? What should happen in the schools? And I told them, uh, quite frankly, that this was the most impoverished exploration of education that any public commission in the history of the United States has ever produced. And that if I was governor, well, I would throw myself into the implementation of the social justice part of it. Uh, I would not implement anything in that commission report that deals with education and the accountability board that's supposed to enforce it. And either using the powers of the governor or new legislation, that simply will not pass if I'm elected governor. Uh, and I'll start to tell you what, what's wrong with it. But you, if you're interested, actually, my, my five-minute answer is, is in here. Um, the very idea from the start 
of a world-class education. What do they think education is? A soccer game, a football game? And we're gonna fire the coach if he doesn't win the, the, the rest of them? As soon as you start this world-class stuff, you're committed, in fact, to having some way of comparing us, the Shanghai and Singapore, the reference countries for that. What does that mean? Objective testing, right? And it means narrower and narrower, narrower conception of education. And it's all, it's all wrong-headed. We've got to think about the mission, their missions of education. Think of them in relationship to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, how do children stay alive? How do they learn how to de-escalate conflict? Right? How, do they, how, do they, how do they learn what they need to learn in terms, of, in terms of health and liberty? How about learning the skills of a democracy? And one last thing, I know that Maryland schools are much better than people think. You know why? Because Joe Biden beat Trump by 30% in Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Education, education is what correlated most sharply with the votes for Biden against Trump. So don't tell me Maryland has a problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. Barron, what would a Governor Barron have as his top priority when it comes to educational reform? All right, I'm standing up for this one. Um, education is one of the main reasons I got into this race. Because Maryland is not making progress in this area. I mentioned more than a quarter of middle school students in our state can't read at a basic level. More than a third can't do basic math. Those numbers are no, those and other achievement numbers are no different than they were 20 years ago. And that is true even though Maryland saw a major rise in education spending, a 40% rise per pupil during the 2000s. I do support the blueprint, but this time we have to do it differently. And this is what separates me from the other candidates. It's not just about the money. It's not just about pouring more money into well-intentioned programs. With the new money that's available through Blueprint, we need to focus that spending on programs that aren't just well-meaning, but have been tested in the real world and shown to make a major difference in people's lives. That's been the mission of my career and of legislation I've gotten enacted into law working with the Obama administration and the Bush administration. Let me give you some concrete examples. So it's not just abstraction. Two concrete proven ideas. Number one, we will expand tutoring to every struggling first and second grader in the entire state of Maryland because that has been shown to move them up toward grade level early before their problems get serious in later grades. We're going to do this by engaging the community, 10,000 people from the community, including retirees and recent college graduates, to become tutors for a modest stipend as a public service. That's number one, statewide initiative, get every kid up reading by third grade. Number two, expand career academies in high poverty schools. These are small learning communities with a career theme and links to local employers who provide internships. They've been tested and, and my philanthropic team expanded them in California. They've been shown to increase long-term earnings by $3,000 per year, 11 years later. We should be doing it at every school in Maryland, every high school in Maryland. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Gansel, your priority list for implementing educational reform as governor. Well, John Barron's my hero, and if he stands up, I'm going to stand up. Um, my mother was a public school teacher, for uh, substitute teacher in Montgomery County for decades. My father, after he was Under Secretary of Defense of the United States, taught down the road here at the University of Maryland. I'm a professor at the at, uh, American University as an adjunct, and I led the fight to organized with SEIU, uh, the American University adjunct professors. Um, we're all products of our, of our learning. We're all products of our teaching. Um, before I came here, I was reading my book. For my, we've had a book club for 33 years. Why do I think it's so important to read? Because I learned it from Ms. Cop at Chevy Chase Elementary, where I grew up. So we, I was the first candidate, uh, if you're looking for the one thing, which was the question, uh, I was the first candidate to come out for auto, uh, universal pre-K. We right now, when, when children start at kindergarten, they're already so far behind, they never catch up. But not only do we need universal pre-K, we need universal child care. And one of the things we can do for teachers at, in terms of universal child care is actually have child care facilities located at schools. So our, we get better, high quality teachers, pay them more, and have accessibility to universal child care for our teachers. You have to practice what you preach. So right now, I'm on the board of uh, College Track right here in Suitland, where Kevin Durant put a lot of money into the program to help kids uh, get into college there. I've been mentoring 
uh, children, students my whole life. I started inner city lacrosse league. I'm 59 years old, I still play lacrosse. It's a little insane, but I do. But I started a league up in Baltimore to help get kids out of a, a rough situation, some of them into schools. We have a program, we're gonna have a, a mental health professional for every 250 students in every school here in Maryland. It's a crisis, we need to address it. Disabilities is a crisis, we need to address it. We don't, we ignore it. There's a plan on our website about mental health and disabilities. We need to have SROs in every school so we don't pipeline children from schools to the juvenile justice system. We keep schools safe and get guns out of schools uh, and we need to support our HBCUs. Thank you, Mr. Gansler. Uh, Mr. Jane, what would a Governor Jane do in terms of educational reform? You get the last word. So my running mate who's sitting in the back is a product of Prince George's County Public Schools. I'm a product of Montgomery County Public Schools. Public education means everything to me and my campaign. When my grandfather immigrated to this country, he found work as a high school custodian to provide for his family of seven and achieve his American dream. Uh, growing up, I attended a Title I elementary school in Wheaton, which had mold on the ceilings, overcrowded with students, great educators who didn't have the resources they needed. And when I was battling cancer in middle school, it was the entire ecosystem of that school. My bus driver, my cafeteria lady, my guidance counselor, my teachers, even the building itself became my safe place where I felt supported. And so that's why if you go to janeforgovernor.com that we've shared since last January 2021, You'll see our entire education plan, which talks about making sure we're mandating financial literacy for our high school students, making sure we have comprehensive sex ed, making sure we have free menstrual products in our public schools as well, making sure we're reducing the student debt for our educators. We have universal pre-K. We invest away from SROs from our public schools and actually invest in more mental health professionals, actually getting to the root of these issues, making sure we're having free public transit so that if you're a student who's taking public transit to get to and from school, you're able to do that with at least a little less cost and a little bit more accessibility. Making sure we have affordable housing. Because educators can't even afford to live in the same areas where they teach. So that's a, that's a disgrace. Making sure also that we prioritize funding for school construction in low-income neighborhoods, which also happen to be predominantly minority neighborhoods. And they're forgotten about by the current governor. And the final piece of this is making sure we have accountability when it comes to the budget. We Maryland residents were promised in 2007 when we voted for the slots that that money would go to public schools. We were lied to because there was no transparency and no accountability. And I am committed to making sure we have a more transparent process. And again, it's because of the way in which I'm running my campaign. I have proven that so far. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jane. Thank you, all of you. Uh, it is no surprise that education is one of the number one topics among voters. And your passion reflected that. To conclude our forum here today, all of you will have two minutes to summarize your last statements. We'll go in this order. Mr. Gansler, you'll be first. Mr. Siegel, second. Mr. Jane, you'll be third. Mr. Barron, fourth. Mr. Perez, you will be last. Uh, Mr. Gansler, please, we'll have two minutes. Thank you again for being here. Thank you again to the other candidates for uh, thinking the green belt matters enough to show up. Um, you know, we have a number of crises we're facing, and we need to make sure we have a, a Democratic nominee for governor that has actually led in time of crisis. For example, when the Beltway snipers came to town, I led the Joint Sniper Task Force to keep people uh, safe. And after 22 days, we brought them in. We need to continue to drive crime down and bring justice up. We need somebody who can uh, lead on the issue of crime. When I was Attorney General, the environment was my biggest issue. We had 22 river audits. We cleaned up the Chesapeake Bay. Climate change is a, is a true existential issue. We need a governor that understands the importance of that and can lead. When, I, when it was time to have marriage equality here in Maryland, I was the only statewide elected official for it. In fact, I wrote an opinion recognizing out-of-state same-sex marriage, and they tried to impeach me in Annapolis, literally. We have the same issue with re women's reproductive rights when the Supreme Court case comes down in the, in the next few months, either re overturning Roe v. Wade or scaling it back significantly. So the most important thing, I, I, the one takeaway that I would like to leave you with today is that we have some great candidates up here and we have some great ideas. But we need a Democrat who can win the general election. It cannot be more important. It cannot be more important now for the blueprint and for these other issues that we've talked about. The Goucher poll shows that a moderate Republican, their nominee, Kelly Schultz, beats a progressive Democrat by 20% in this state this year right now. 
the Republican Governor Association already started attacking me because they realized that I'm the only candidate that can win the general election. We've lost three out of the last five elections here in Maryland for governor. We cannot afford underserved communities, people of color, nobody can afford to have four more, eight more years of a Republican. So we actually need to win. We need someone with experience. We, need, we cannot have anyone that's unvetted, and I ask for your vote. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Mr. Gansler, for being here today. Mr. Siegel, your concluding remarks. So I'm going to talk about something you haven't heard much about, which is foreign policy. I ran against Cardin in 2018, largely on that. Yes, well, what does foreign policy have to do with being governor? Well, a lot more than you think, okay? And I'm not just talking about uh, Hogan's uh, executive order making it uh, uh, essentially almost illegal to be like Ben and Jerry's and boycott West Bank settlements. I'm talking about things like the gas tax holiday that Maryland just took the lead in dealing with. We've got two crises in the, in the world today, right now. One is global warming, and the other is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Well, let's just focus on the second, okay, and link it, and link it to Maryland. The biggest issue right now in Europe is, is roiled over this, has to do with Germany and its import of Russian oil. And the problem is, that the Russian economy, in fact, is rebounding because of its oil sales. And the question is, will Germany, will Germany stop buying that oil from Russia? And it won't, because its, its economy will tank. Well, the United States buys a billion barrels of crude a year from overseas. If we stop buying that and put that back out to, onto the world market, it would, it would more than suffice for all of Germany's needs, okay? Why don't we do that, and what have we done instead? What we did instead was that we pioneered and led the country in reducing gas taxes, right? In other words, what we did was, and, and, and Biden opened up the, the oil reserves to maximize supply to meet this demand. What we should have done is just the opposite. We should have cut demand in Maryland patriotically like they did in World War, in World War II. 30 million car, 3 million cars were built in 1941. In 1943, it went from 3 million to 300 cars in the whole country. We cut oil, we cut oil gasoline consumption by one seventh in the United States by rallying patriotically, driving less, driving slower, going EV, right? We do that, we'll put a billion barrels back in there and we'll help the Ukrainians. That's the connection between being governor and thinking globally. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Thank you for being here today. Mr. Jane. All right, thanks again for having me. Uh, my name is Ashwani Jane, and I'm running for governor to make politics inclusive and accessible. That's why, unlike other candidates, I am fully accessible, because 100% of our events are free. And I'm the only governor candidate to personally go door to door in a different county every day of the week. I am fully accountable because 100% of our campaign is run by residents from every age, background, and county. And I am fully transparent because we've shared the most detailed and comprehensive policy agenda since last January 2021, found at janeforgovernor.com. We've already built one of the largest grassroots campaigns in this state, and we've accomplished that without, without focusing on fundraising and polling numbers. Instead, we have focused on engaging more residents in the process, empowering volunteers, and one-on-one -on -one voter contact. If you have any other questions about what was discussed today, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one with me, you can go to janeforgovernor.com. My personal cell phone is on the business card that's on your seat. I'm happy to make the time. You don't have to donate any money. You don't have to make any commitments. But I do appreciate this opportunity. Thank you for moderating. Thank you to my fellow candidates, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jane. And Mr. Perez, thank you. You started here. Everybody was standing up. You stood up first, and everyone is following suit. So we like this here. Mr. Barron, your final statement. I'm running for governor because Maryland is stuck. We are not solving major problems, particularly social problems. Our education achievement numbers haven't improved in 20 years. Wages for the bottom 40% have been stagnant since the 1980s. Poverty numbers have not changed since, uh, you know, for over 30 years. Now, all of us, all the candidates up here, we all share similar goals. We all want to address these problems. We all want to improve education and so on. Here's how I'm different. 
My approach to achieving those goals, those democratic goals, is very different from the other candidates. What they are proposing is the same old playbook of expanding or rolling out one unproven plan after the next and hoping it's going to work. We have done that. That's what we've been doing for decades. I mean, 20 years from now, while our children look back at this time and say that we faced all these persistent problems and we just kept doing the same thing again and again, or will they look back and say that at this moment, Maryland did something extraordinary? We, re we rewrote the playbook. We pioneered a fundamentally new governing approach based on evidence about what actually works to improve people's lives and that we finally moved the needle on education and stagnant wages and health care and other problems. That is the future I want for Maryland. I'm asking for your help to get us there. Now, in my last 30 seconds, I want to agree with my friend Doug Gansler. We need a candidate who can win in the general election, which is not a straightforward thing at all in Maryland in the governor's race. My message can do that. I have a I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I've been an appointee of President Bush and President Clinton, bipartisan. I've worked with Democrats and Republicans. My message has resonated because it is a bipartisan message. It is, I'm not advocating a major expansion in state spending or taxes. I'm advocating a ma major increase in the effectiveness of state spending. Let's do what works. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here with us today. And to finish our form, Mr. Perez, you get the last words. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your activism. And a special thanks to Senator Paul Pinsky for his leadership on the Climate Action Bill in Annapolis. Thank you so much, Senator, for all you do. I'm Tom Perez, and I'm part of the GSD wing of the Democratic Party. I want to get stuff done. I sometimes use a different S word, but I'm sticking with G-rated S words today, okay? And as you've heard today, the next governor is going to have to be the implementer in chief. The next governor is going to have to be the multitasker in chief because we have multiple crises. We have multiple challenges. But in those moments of the darkest nights, we often see the brightest stars. And my career has been about getting stuff done, getting stuff done at a local level on the Montgomery County Council, getting stuff done here in Maryland. When we had the foreclosure crisis, when I was your labor secretary here, we passed sweeping reforms. The number one epicenter of the foreclosure crisis was Prince George's County, and we protected you. As your U.S. Civil Rights Division had. We took on voting rights. We took on educational reform. We took on police reform. And we got stuff done. As your labor secretary, we made sure if you worked a full day's, way, day's work, you got a full day's pay. We took on tough fights. When Verizon was on strike, 45,000 strong. Who settled that case? That was me. Brought people together from Maine down to Virginia, and we settled the case. That's what we need. We need someone who can get stuff done. And we need someone who understands that the state government under this governor has been hollowed out. There are so many agencies that we are going to read about the day he leaves that need incredible help. And that's the work I've done. When I got to the U.S. Labor Department, we were second from the bottom in worker satisfaction. Thank God for DHS. When I left, we were in the top third, top quarter, because I listened to employees. We got stuff done. That's what I will do in Maryland. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Perez. And let's thank all five of our would-be governors up here for taking the time to be with us today. Wonderful ideas. We Marylanders will be in good hands. Let's have Conrad come on back up. I just want to say a few things. Um, number one, speaking of information from the candidates, in the back of the room, you will see campaign literature that's been provided by them. So definitely check that out. As David said, don't hesitate in shaking hands and expressing concerns, questions that you might have for any of the candidates. Also, do want to thank again the American Legion for making this possible. They're nonpartisan, but they're the ones that put the seats up. They're the ones. I got the lights going. They're the ones that work with Greenbelt Access TV. And also want to thank the Greenbelt News Review and the Washington Informer for being here. And I also want to thank the gentleman on my right, who is an incredible guy, Dave Zarin. All right.
Thank you for coming.